It looks like we've got a full house here, and that's a good thing. Welcome to the 2023 G3. Well, I can't go that way. Let me go this way. Welcome to the 2023 G3 National Conference Q&A plenary session. <laughs> Phil, you're going to follow me? You're following me? Okay, I'll, I'll go that, I'll go that, I'll go on that end. I'll switch ends. That's perfect. Yeah. I had them all lined up, and now we've got to, got to kind of do things a little bit differently. To my right, your left, I have Phil Johnson, Dr. Stephen Lawson, Dr. Mike Riccardi, Dr. James Coates, Dr. Josh Bice, Dr. Vody Bauckham, Dr. Owen Strand, Paul Washer, or rather, I'm sorry, Paul, Paul is not, unable to join us. I have uh, Dr. James White and Dr. Scott Annual. Welcome them, please. We, got, we have a gap here. I, I'd like to fix our gap before we, before we get going here. I, I, I thought the guys on the stage are stagehands. Maybe they can help us with this gap. Do you, do you want us to move this over? I'd love for you guys to come a little closer. That would be Vo wonderful. Vody is here, so we yeah. can do this. Let <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Musical chairs. Yeah, yeah that's what we have. Exactly. Well, welcome, gentlemen. Excited to have you with us for this 2023 G3 National Conference. Excited to have all you men on the stage with us. I know that those who are here are excited to hear from you. Uh, I've got a, a, a lineup of questions that I want to ask, and I'll be asked. I know some of you think that because the panel is so large, you won't have the opportunity to answer. That will not be the case, Phil. Oh, see now. <laughs> You're off the hook. I got no. No, okay. Well, while they figure, are you back? Are you? It's dead. It's dead. That's okay. I <laughs> test, test. That's okay. I'm the only non-doctor here, anyway. I, so, if anybody has a medical emergency, and is there a doctor in the house? There's a bunch of them, but I'm not one. Hopefully we get that fixed. That said, I want to begin by asking a quick question. And Dr. Bice, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, the question is this. Uh, with a conference this size, as we've kind of witnessed what's going on in culture and in the church, uh, the idea about God's sovereignty is being challenged at every angle. Uh, and it's with that in mind that I want to ask, why is a conference on God's sovereignty essential? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, first of all, great to have you with us for this conference. Uh, this is a very important theme. Um, again, this is a bedrock doctrine in Scripture, as I said in the opening sermon. So, everything that you experience in life, everything from the birth of your children, the education of your children, uh, everything from life and death to politics, everything is connected to this critical doctrine, a bedrock foundational doctrine, the sovereignty of God. This is not some sort of pietistic thing that we're doing here. And so we have to be careful not to elevate political theology above theology proper. And we have to keep the, the cart from getting before the horse. And so we believe that when we come together like this and study the doctrine of God, of God's sovereignty, what happens is that it, 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 it helps us, it strengthens us to be able to go back into life, into the circles of life, into the workplace, into the public square, into our local churches, because this, this doctrine impacts everything, including the worship service on the Lord's Day. So this is a critical doctrine. And so, yeah, that's the purpose. That's great. That's great. A lot of the questions that I've found is are, are, are incredibly you know, practical. What, how do we take theology and then apply it to real life? So there's a number of questions uh, as it relates to kind of providing counsel. Uh, and so I want to open things up and, and allow any of you to answer. It's, I'm gonna, I'm, in some instances, I'll point to someone in particular. Uh, in other instances, I want you to just think through the question a bit. And if you have, have an idea or a thought comes to mind, maybe jump in at it. And the question begins this way. What counsel would you give a family that is searching for a healthy 
church in their region? We get this question often, uh, phone calls often. I know many of you men as pastors hear this question often. So let me repeat it again as you think through it. What counsel would you give a family that is searching for a healthy church in their region? Go to the G3 website. There's a search function, find a church, and see if there's one in your region. That's one way to start. Anyone else? This, and, and the, re <laughs> the, the, reason, the, the reason I pause is this is a very, very common question. Uh, there are folks who travel far and wide. I know where we are in uh, Douglasville at Praise Mill, we have folks traveling from an hour away or more uh, in an attempt to find a good local church. Uh, they're just having a difficult time. There aren't a lot of strong churches out there with sound biblical teaching and doctrine. And so this is an important question. I want to pause here and give you just some time to think about how you'd respond. That, that is the most a common question that we get at Grace to You as well, and it's not an easy one to answer always. It depends on the area people live in, but there are lots of places across the country that w really there's not a decent church in driving distance, and uh, uh, there, there are a couple of things you can do about that. One is if you're spiritually mature and, and pretty solid in your own doctrinal understanding, find some like-minded people and organize a church plant. Uh, most seminaries will send graduates to plant churches in needy areas. I know the Master's Seminary does that all the time. And by the way, the Master's Seminary also has a website that you, you can look at the, at the map and it, it has little pins where their, their graduates are pastoring churches. But if you can't plant a church and, uh, and you, you don't know any else, anyone else in your community who's like-minded and, and you don't feel equipped to evangelize the community, it might be worth considering a move. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily out of the question to move to an area where you know there's a decent church because I think your fellowship in Christ is more important really even than your career. So you have to give up a career and you know move to a different job and a different location. I think your spiritual uh, life and nourishment is more important than the comfort of a job you've you're comfortable in. Okay, that's good. I I, I actually want to I actually want to um, uh, aim this question at Dr. Mike Riccardi, primarily because he thought he was going to get away without answering a question, and and secondarily because I think it's right in your your wheelhouse. What what counsel would you give a younger pastor who is just coming into the doctrines of grace, but he finds himself in a context of a church that is hostile to the sovereignty of God? I think, first of all, you know, you just, you need to have God be your God. I mean, if you're going to embrace the doctrines of grace, uh, you need to know that whatever the consequences are for holding to the truth, you have to be willing to face them. So first of all, you know, bow before that sovereign God in worship and ask him for the, the grace and the patience and the fortitude to, to insist on the truth without uh, running over the sheep. So one, uh, be courageous. But two, before that sovereign God, you know, that, that savior who is the good shepherd, um, ask for God to be uh, unusual in his dispensation of graciousness to you. You are a, a shepherd of the flock, and you need to not drive the sheep, not run over the sheep, not beat the sheep over the head, but lead them to graze in the rich pastures of these wonderful truths. I mean, these are the doctrines of grace ought to make you gracious, and it's not about fighting the people you're there to serve and build into. It's about uh, laying your life down and serving them so that they can see the same truths that you've seen. Uh, the truth doesn't need uh, the help of personality or rhetoric. It just needs to be, to be shown. If you can demonstrate from the passages of Scripture with no agenda aside from, I'm taking the next verse, the next paragraph, the next pericope, and, and not necessarily using theological jargon, but demonstrating the biblical realities uh, that we've seen and celebrated already, Isaiah 41, Romans 9, uh, Romans 11, um, 
is, and, the, and the rest of the passages we've heard and will hear from, th this is not something you have to go looking for to find biblical support for. So, so just o open the, the, the pages of Scripture and, uh, as our brother has said, let it fly. I yeah, I thought I, I thought that was a cue as he kind of looked at Dr. Lawson. I thought that might be a be a cue to start something. Yeah, would you want to comment, sir? I was talking to Michael. Okay, okay. You, you interrupted us. I'm sorry. He said, <laughs> he said, you never sound so wise as when you quote me. Uh, I didn't want you to say that to well. everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, since, since, since you're, you're warmed up, you're good, you're good. I thought I might ask the question, and I, I won't pick on Dr. Lawson. I might get in trouble later on, so I'll leave, I'll leave this open to everyone. And that is, the question is this, what is a reformed church? We hear a lot of folks who open the doors of their church and believe themselves to be reformed. Maybe they've taken on a, a reformed soteriology and maybe their worship still kind of looks like something that is not so reformed. So how would you answer the question or respond to the question, what is a reformed church? It is a biblical church. Mm -hmm. You want to flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, I'll flesh that out. Uh, a little bit. Uh, I think it begins with the pulpit, um, that it, the pulpit is regulated by the preaching of the Word of God. It is the preaching of the full counsel of the Word of God, where every truth and every doctrine that is addressed in Scripture uh, is taught. Um, in the Reformation, they spoke of sola scriptura. They also spoke of tota scriptura, which means all of Scripture. So a scripture alone, but also all of scripture. So it, it really begins with the pulpit. It, it includes the worship service. Um, that would be the regulative principle. It is regulated by the word of God. So what we see um, in scripture, either by example or instruction or reasonably implied, is what will take place in the worship service. So if it's not set forth in Scripture, we're not going to bring it into the worship service. But this, the entire worship service is singing the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, praying the Word of God, uh, reading the Word of God. Uh, it would include the, the church government and the structure of the church, um, how it is set up and run, uh, I believe with a plurality of, of elders. And a Reformed church um, would carry out its functions of ministry in a way that is in alignment with the truth of the Word of God. So it's not just the message, but also the methodology uh, that is critically important. And obviously there are, you know, 50 other things that we could add, and I don't want to give a, a, a long answer, but at the very heart, it's really sola scriptura that Scripture is the authority for everything in the church. Um, in the truest sense, um, a Reformed church is, is not even an elder-led church. It is a Scripture-led church, and the elders are under the authority of Scripture. It is not a congregation-led church. The congregation is under the authority of the Word of God, and it's not a pastor-led church. Uh, the pastor is under the authority of the Word of God. Even the church constitution is, is, is to yield to the authority of the Word of God. And the ultimate uh, deciding matter on anything and everything is not our tradition. It is what does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have to say about this, Peter, Paul, etc. So it, it's it's... It's really a return to Scripture, and we could put it this way. Christ formed the church, and the apostles, under the teaching of Christ, formed the church. Then, in the era of the church fathers, they conformed the church as best they could to sound doctrine. The Roman Catholic Church then deformed the church for a thousand years, and the Reformation reformed it back to the way Christ and the apostles set it up. 
So that's what a reformed church is. You are reforming it back to how Christ formed it and how the apostles formed it. And it is the antithesis of the Catholic church, which deformed it for a thousand years. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. <laughs> Dr. James Coates, I want to kind of come to you because he... In, in the initial answer that Dr. Lawson gave to us, he talked about how a Reformed church is a biblical church, um, expository preaching, uh, uh, an adherence, a, a fidelity to the Word of God. Kind of unpack for us just a little bit, if you would, uh, what being a Reformed church, a biblical church, and the context that you were in helped shape as you helped shape you and your congregation as you navigated some of the challenges that you navigated. Well, I think the principle that comes out in a big way and what Dr. Lawson just expressed is the Lordship of Christ. So a, a Reformed church is going to hold high the Lordship of Christ and submit to his Lordship in everything. So when you end up in a battle with the governing authorities, for example, and, and the battle is at the very point of the headship of Christ over his church, that's going to trigger a time to, to stand up and... and honor Christ by being willing to be obedient even in the face of punishment and suffering. So I think the Lordship of Christ is critical in really encapsulating everything that Dr. Lawson just expressed. That's good. I want to ask this, this question of, of Josh Bice, Dr. Bice, and ask you this. Do, and this, this is kind of where it gets a little, little bit sticky, if you will. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'm sure everyone else will be interested to hear it. Do you consider yourself an abolitionist? Do you consider yourself an abolitionist? Um, I do consider myself to be an abolitionist. Um, <clears throat> for, for a very long time, I did not. Um, and, and I would engage in what might be considered incrementalism, the, the idea of pushing back slowly against abortion, um, but as I, as I read scripture and as I looked at the way that the quote-unquote pro-life establishment opposes the full abolition of abortion and also, and, and here's the, the real big issue, is, is what the text of scripture says. And when you look at things like here in the state of Georgia, you have what's called a heartbeat law or a heartbeat bill that was passed, right? So... Um, the church seems to rally around that. It seems to be very popular. Christians support it. The problem with that is Proverbs 20 and verse 10 says that unequal weights and unequal measurements are an abomination to the Lord. So what happens in those specific states that adopt a law or pass a bill like that is that you, you, you create two classes of babies. One class that's protected by law and another class of babies that's handed over to murderers. And so for me, it just became a clear thing. You know, this is what the Bible says, and we should stand for the fact that the Scripture teaches that life begins at conception, not at six weeks or 15 weeks or 12 weeks. And when we have someone like former President Trump, who seems to be very bold on issues, and, and he's really not ashamed to, to stand on principle or conviction, but he can't seem to answer a question when it comes to the protection of the unborn. We as the church of Jesus Christ need to do just that. And so for me, um, it's not that I'm against anyone that would say, I, I want to see, you know, a, a, a further advancement of, you know, standing for life in my state. But, but here's the problem. In the state of Louisiana, a few years back, there was a bill that was placed uh, out for, you know, consideration. They had a great deal of support, and it was on the full abolition of abortion. And just before the vote, 70 pro-life organizations wrote a letter, including the National Right to Life, that actually stood in opposition to the bill that would protect every life in the state. So guess what happened to the bill? It failed. That's the pro-life establishment. So I reject that type of thing. I stand for the full abolition of abortion. And I think if we as the church would stand up and speak up and be clear about that and educate our church about that, we would see this cause advance across the nation. Yeah. Amen.
Bloody, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Um, I'm, I'm, inter I'm genuinely interested in, in your answer to this. Um, as, as we witness, you know, the, the feminization in culture, I, I know almost a decade ago, I, I heard you speak very, very, you know, vociferously against uh, just feminism in and of itself and uh, your stance against it and, and even in a way of warning of, of what it would look like over time in the church. I remember watching YouTube videos where you were railing against these kinds of things. I'm sure a lot of the folks in our audience uh, are familiar with that too, but even, even as such, we've seen a steady rise of egalitarianism within evangelicalism uh, in recent days. How does the Bible address these issues? How should we as Christians think about these issues? How should pastors relate to these issues as they come up? The, the rise of egalitarianism, uh, which is the, the result of the feminized culture in which we live. How should we respond to that? Yeah, um, I think we respond, respond to it. The short answer is from scripture. But I think what we need to recognize is that people have been running away from this biblical picture of headship, this biblical picture of patriarchy. And we don't like that, right? We, we, we don't even like that word. Some people just like shivered just because I said patriarchy, right? Um, but the, the problem with that is, number one, it's a biblical idea. The idea of male headship is a biblical idea. And what people are responding to in a negative sense is a caricature of that, not the biblical picture that sees, you know, man and woman created in the image of God completely equal to one another. And yet in this relationship where there is loving headship and submission for the purpose of fulfilling God's call for that relationship. We're just, we're not presenting that picture. Instead, people had this caricature of, oh, well, the Bible hates women, uh, but the Apostle Paul hates women. And instead of taking the time to explain to them why that's a mischaracterization, we just sort of backed up and said, oh, you know, no, 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 we're not like that. No, no, we don't want you to think that way about us. No, no, no. And we just kept giving ground. And, and look where it's gotten us, right? Look where now it's not, you know, male, female headship. It's what's a man, what's a woman, right? Um, and so, no, we, we need to articulate very clearly what it is that God has designed, why God has designed it, why it is the best thing possible for us and why the alternative has proven to be disastrous and we ought to run away from it. Phil, Phil was there anything you wanted to add to that? You look like you were, you were. No, okay. I was, I enjoy every okay. word Vody ever uh, says. Yeah, I was just eating it up. Uh, yeah. Okay. I was just checking. I saw a little, you know, I'm just watching cues, so no, no. you're good? I'm good. Okay. I want to I wanna ask Scott this question because I think what's, what's taken place in a lot of churches uh, as it relates to music and to worship, uh, Vody talked about the feminization of, of kind of what's happening in culture, its impact on the church. Uh, kind of speak to us a little bit, if you would, about, about the, the kinds of songs we sing, the kind of worship that we engage in. Kind of speak to us a little bit about why that's important and why what we, what we choose to sing about in worship uh, has, has an impact. Yeah. I think for, for too long, we've d diligently reformed our theology according to Scripture, rightly so but fail to reform our practice, particularly in corporate worship, according to scripture. We've divorced our theology from the impact of culture on our churches, failing to recognize that a lot of things, for instance, the vote he was talking about, the egalitarian feminization of culture has crept into the church, into our practice. And that is evidenced largely in, in many ways, but largely in our music. Um, I mentioned this in my breakout, that's largely due to the fact that we no longer sing the psalms. And when we no longer sing the psalms, we no longer make sure that our 
corporate worship singing is modeled after the inspired songs of scripture, then inevitably our music begins to devolve and be influenced by the negative impact of culture. And that's feminization, that's all sorts of problems. And so, you know, what, what we end up having is a devolution of music in worship that really uh, is, you know, sort of feel-good escapist ditties that are better at forming snowflakes than warriors. When the Psalms have been given to us to praise the Lord, to form our theology in such a way that we are responding as, as, with, with strong conviction to the truths of the Word of God. So my, the solution is, is no more than what we've been really focusing on. That's go back to the Word. I'm not, I don't, I'm not arguing for exclusive psalmody, but I'm not arguing for no psalmody either. We need the psalms, and we need the psalms to be the model for what we sing in corporate worship. That's good. That's good. I, I'm going to open this up, and, and uh, I've, got a, I've got an intention of where I'll land, but, but I want to ask the question, why is expository preaching the best way to preach the Word of God? Why is expository preaching the best way to preach the Word of God? Well, it's not just the best way, it's the only way. It's not just what we say, but how we say it. It's not just what we preach, but how we preach that is important to God. And the Scripture has set forth, really, the, the structure for how we are to preach. In 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul says... <laughs> Until I come, give attention to, and there are three things. The reading, the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. That, that's the minimalist understanding of what preaching is to be. You are to read the text, you are to teach the text, which includes two things, to rightly interpret it, and then to draw the theology and doctrine out of this text, and then to exhort is really the application and, and really driving it home in a compelling way that brings the listener to the intersection of life where they have to make a decision which way will, will they go. A shortened form of that, shortened form of that would be 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. So that's what expository preaching is. It is just very simply preaching the word of God where you start with the text, you stay with the text, you support it with other texts, such that really the preacher just becomes the mouthpiece for the Word of God. Uh, J.I. Packer defined it in three words, letting text talk. So the preacher, you know, the, it, it really doesn't matter what the preacher thinks. Uh, all that matters is what does God say in His Word, and so expository preaching is what sets that forth. Now, there's different kinds of expository preaching Yeah, come on, Paul. Come on, come on. So, Paul, Paul, why are you late? I mean, what was more important than, than this? Were you having um, coffee? I know, I know the answer to that. <laughs> you got an answer yeah. for what? I'm a missionary. <laughs> I was... I, I got this wonderful opportunity to share Christ with this beautiful young lady. Why would I come up here? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Paul, would you just say sola scriptura with a Spanish accent for us? <laughs> or with Latin. <laughs> sola scriptura. <laughs> okay. Let me let me do this. I appreciate the, the response there. I want to I want to continue just to ask the, the question about about preaching. Uh, I, I know Dr. Lawson always gets asked that question. Um, I want to I want some other men to maybe step into that space uh, and speak to us about your passion uh, for preaching. I'm, I'm definitely looking at you, Brother James. What, what is the passion for preaching expositionally? So scripture is powerful. Brother James. 
And, and to unlock the power of Scripture, you have to understand it. So as pastors, our responsibility is to preach the Word to make the meaning clear. I mean, John MacArthur's ministry is, in my estimation, the, the, the model and example of this. When the believer understands the Word of God, it begins to work in their life to generate the fruit of a godly life. And so our job as pastors is to, just as Dr. Lawson said, get the meaning of the text right, proclaim it, press it home on the heart of the listener, and bring them to that point where there is a decisive decision to, to deal with the content of that passage. And when you begin to preach the word, God's promise in Isaiah 55 is that it will bear fruit. It's going to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. So because scripture is powerful and the meaning is in the text, people need to understand what it means. Dr. James White, you have something you want to jump in and say? You just heard Brother James, and you were like, what in the world? Yeah. There's more, there's more than one of us up here, so I, I think they've covered that subject very, very well. Good. Let me ask this question. Uh, all the talk right now regarding Christian nationalism. Um, should we or should we not embrace the label? Should we or should we not embrace the label Christian nationalism? I'll let anybody who wants to jump into that answer or respond. Didn't we cover that on Wednesday? <laughs> well, not everybody was here Wednesday. That's true. Yeah. That's true. They'll have to. They'll have to have to go listen to, especially Josh Weiss's comments on that. Uh, I, I don't like. The, I don't like the phraseology. Um, right now, there are people, and I could name names, but there are specific. I, I'm seeing things. Uh, large gatherings, almost this large of people saying and doing really weird things uh, under the name of Christian nationalism. And it's, it's, not, it's not reformed. It doesn't have a, a, a meaningful theological foundation to it. So uh, the, the problem is that we are confusing a political movement that really is disconnected from the gospel from a more serious discussion that I think needs to take place uh, and is taking place and started taking place in 2020 when we had to start thinking through the relationship of the church and state in a way that we, we had not had to think through for any of our lifetimes, let's put it that way. And when churches closed down and then opened up, others didn't close down at all, there was all sorts of discussion about what it means to love your neighbor. Uh, there was serious division that took place, and there were very large churches that stayed closed for, you know, you know, a year and a half, all in the name of love. Love of what was really the question that, that, we, that we had. And so um, I, I think there are different, a lot of different perspectives that people are bringing to that particular phrase. And unfortunately, especially given our context in social media, it's easy to attach to the side you don't like all sorts of negativity that maybe not isn't part of what they're actually talking about in the first place. Uh, I have been very strongly encouraging people to recognize that we are facing a period of time that is unprecedented in any of our lives. I'm one of the older people on the uh, platform. I'm not going to make the mistake I made last time uh, and ask about other grandparents on the uh, on the panel, but there are some at least this time. There wasn't before. But certainly in, in my life, I was raised in a situation where we never dreamed that the, church would, that the church would be impacted by government decrees, government actions, things along those lines. Now we're having to think through, what does that mean? We are seeing technocratic totalitarianism rising across the world. I don't think that you have to be a conspiracy theorist uh, to read what people with the WEF and Harari and people like that are writing and saying. And so we haven't dealt with this before, and that means we may stumble, but we need to hear other perspectives other than our own as well. And I have seen a movement. I have seen, I have seen the church standing up and saying, there's something about the Lordship of Christ that is more than just simply something you put in a hymn. It, it should impact how we function as a church. Um, and so I'm thankful for that, uh, but I am concerned that a lot of the conversation frequently is marked by either an acerbic attitude that shouldn't be there or an unwillingness to even think about the fact that maybe I need to start thinking about things I've not thought about before. Uh, none of us have the expertise on this thing because we've never faced 
this kind of a situation before. We need each other's voices to have the wisdom to make application of what Scripture says uh, to a very, very difficult context that we're facing. I love what my, amen. I love what my colleague says there, good words, wise words. I would fundamentally say that we're seeing a referendum on the lack of public theology in evangelical circles of the last 20 years. Uh, for 50, some time, 50, 60, 50, 60, depending on how old one is, no pun intended. <laughs> I, I would say more, but he's my boss, so I need to be nice here. Hey, I'm a flautist. I live boldly, baby. <laughs> So I would just say um, the neither left nor right ideology that got into the evangelical and reform bloodstream in the last 10 to 20 years was absolutely disastrous for politics. And it makes sense to me that a lot of young people in particular, but the church in general, is at some level drawn to what is called Christian nationalism because political or public theology was abdicated. And, and lots of young people were just told we're neither left nor right. Meanwhile, babies are being slaughtered, kids are being transed, government is being taken over by so socialism, and the world is going woke, and the, and the church effectively has no answer. And so it makes perfect sense that those who are stepping up to the mic to give an answer are going to draw a crowd. If other leaders are going to abdicate and fall silent, those who are going to be bold and courageous and speak, whether we end up agreeing totally or not, are going to get market share. Here is what I would say for the church to consider. When I hear someone like Vody articulate his understanding of Christian nationalism, I amen it. Uh, when I hear others uh, give their presentation of it, you know, in terms of wanting a moral public order, I understand that and so much agree with that. I just would point out one thing to the church, one small matter. We are now a holy nation. 1 Peter 2.9. We are an ethnos hagios, according to Peter. We are now a Christian nation, and our founder and builder and king is Jesus Christ. It is no earthly sovereign. I am not looking. I am not ultimately looking, as I think many of us are tempted to, for the virtuous leader who will set the world to rights before Jesus comes back. I understand the desire. I pray for good leaders. I do not mock that desire. That is a good desire. But the one who is going to put the world to rights is Jesus and Jesus alone. So that's what I would say. Well said, well said. Uh, anyone else wanted to add into that part of that conversation? Wanted to leave that open. That said, I, I want to move to the next uh, topic here. And really, since Brother Paul has joined us, we're glad to have you. I know they're glad to have you. We're talking about the issue of the sovereignty of God. And um, I, I want to ask you particularly, how should the sovereignty of God impact our approach to missions? How should the sovereignty of God, how should we view missions through the lens of God's sovereignty? Um, there's two, two ways of looking at that. First of all, Let's not divide missions from any sort of church planting, all the work of ministry, because you do missions abroad the same way you do it in a rural area in America. It's through, through preaching, prayer, and piety. And so that kind of work is hard. It will bear the greatest eternal fruit, but sometimes it requires a great deal of plowing and sorrow and faith fighting many many battles so we need the strength of the sovereign christ to keep going forward to keep going forward um, one of the things that most terrifies me about all this social media is young men are no longer living 10 15 years in anonymity where no one knows their name and they're allowed to feel like an abject failure but that's real ministry. So you need a sovereign Christ in order to keep going, to keep going. Then, then the other thing that we need to see is that there is a real sense in which sola scriptura 
is tied to the idea of the sovereignty and authority of Christ because we are being asked to use means that seem foolish to the carnal man. And so we have to believe that this sovereign God has ordained these means and these means alone to advance his kingdom. But we believe that if we're faithful in that, that uh, he will do the work through that. The work of missions is the work of God. It's an absolute impossibility. And if we want to join him in that, we have to do, well, it's Christ's church, Christ's way. So that would be my answer. That's great. I know many of you men are reading books about God's sovereignty, and I know we did in preparation for our time here. I want to start down uh, on this end with you, Dr. Coltson, just kind of walk through, ask just the question, maybe a, a, a book that you've either read or something that, was in, that influenced you and, and helped open your eyes to, to God's sovereignty in whatever area of life. That's tough. Um, you know, I um, have been doing a lot of reading on the doctrine of election in preparation for the session today and uh, have been in systematics, commentaries, the whole nine yards. Uh, to be really honest with you, I think that the content in biblical doctrine on soteriology is phenomenal. And so I think the, the clarity with which these, these weighty, heavy subjects are expressed, the the, the accessibility of it, the simplicity of it, even the eloquence of it. I would, I would highly recommend Biblical Doctrine on Soteriology as a, a great place to get a, a holistic appreciation for uh, the doctrines of grace and all that God's doing in salvation. One of the most tried and true, I think, articulations of the sovereignty of God is A.W. Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God, uh, that treats the doctrine as we're doing in this conference from all different angles, all different aspects of the sovereignty of God in a very thorough and biblical way. So highly recommend Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God. There's a sermon in the Banner of Truth edition of Jonathan Edwards, which I can no longer read. Um, if you've ever seen it, it's because it's three point font. Uh, but if you can blow it up, do something to be able to read it, there's a sermon by Jonathan Edwards on the sovereignty of God that, um, Reading all of the Puritans along those lines, you're going to get similar things. But he was just so, so very, very good on that. And, of course, I've used a quote. And I'm going to have to steal this before Phil can get to it. Sorry, Phil, you're at the end of the line. Um, but Spurgeon, of course, said that uh, men will allow God to uh, be lighting the stars of heaven, to be in his, I think he used the term, almondry, uh, giving out his gifts, so on and so forth. But when you begin to preach the sovereignty of God, men begin to gnash their teeth because you are making them creatures uh, and putting them in the proper place in relationship to God. And I've used that quote for a long time because a lot of people in the church, that's what they'll do. As long as the sovereignty of God means something out there, I'm fine. But as soon as it impinges upon my freedom, then I, I gnash my teeth. And uh, we see that a lot. When I was in college, I was an Arminian. And uh, some buddies of mine got reformed by reading Jonathan Edwards. So we're Edwards two for two here. And uh, so I swore to defeat the Calvinists who had risen among us. And I said I would read the New Testament and find everything in it that would refute Calvinism. And I got to the book of Ephesians and gave up. And so, <laughs> true story. So Ephesians is undefeated, just so you know, Apostle Paul and Holy Spirit above him. Um, I would say in terms of an extra biblical book, Jonathan Edwards, the end for which God created the world, uh, he just takes back everything for, for God and it returns sovereignty to God. And last comment shows that the purpose of existence is not this, joy, this joyless, dry, legalistic, uh, miserable life, but is actually a full-throated, full-hearted, joyful, God-exalting pursuit of God. He, he gives you such a beautiful vision of that. So Edwards, and for which God created the world. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And in a similar way, in my seminary work, I went to a school that was very, how do we put this, hated Calvinists. Um, and I thought I was supposed to hate Calvinists too. 
And in one of my courses, um, one of my evangelism courses, um, we were talking about revival and they messed up and introduced me to Edwards. And it was a very similar thing, same, same work between that and pink. Um, and, and just seeing the sovereignty of God. Um, and again, going back to seeing the sovereignty of God in election, um, you know, all, all of those things. Um, so I would just echo those and you just, I was hoping that you didn't say that one because I was next, but, um, yeah, you can't beat Edwards and pink. So I'm going to keep up with everyone else. A.W. Pink on the sovereignty of God in terms of a book. I would just highly commend that to you. Um, it really helped me understand and grasp these doctrines well. I would also commend to you the preaching of James Montgomery Boyce. Um, we have his sermons in our app. So if you go and search, you can find his work through Ephesians there. It's very helpful. Uh, John MacArthur preaching on the sovereignty of God, R.C. Sproul. So I just want to commend good preaching to you. Listen to those, those men. I've learned a lot by listening to Dr. Stephen Lawson on, on this subject, reading his books on this subject. So I commend those resources to you. Uh, for me, it would be hands down um, the life and ministry of R.C. Sproul. Um, his, it was a it was in a video cassette, his whole series on the holiness of God. Now you say, well, holiness, sovereign. What, what the holiness of God did was it set a healthy context for the doctrine of sovereignty because it, it displayed before me a God that I had never seen, a God so large, so glorious, so loving, so wise, so holy, that when you get to things that may be difficult to understand about his works, you just know they're right, even if you cannot fully comprehend them. And so I owe, you know, I would, I'll just share with you, someone sent that to me, and I was a young missionary in Peru, and I had a little TV screen and a little, you could put the big cassette in there, and, and when I turned it on, I was sitting like this in a metal chair, and in about a few minutes, I noticed I was sitting like this, and as it went on, the first series, I was on the edge of my seat. And then um, I watched most of it either on my knees or on my face before God. And it was so transformative that I hadn't yet become uh, Calvinistic or anything, but it, it set the healthy context for that doctrine. So I, too, when I, when I was 20 years old, read The End for Which God Created the World by Jonathan Edwards and actually led a group of friends uh, in a study through it, and it totally changed uh, our lives and, and set before us a God who was God-centered for his own sake. We always thought, well, we're supposed to be God-centered because we're men and he's created us to worship him, but sort of in back of that, it was... Uh, but God makes much of us, right? Because God's loving and, and God, you know, wants to bless his creatures. So we'll be God-centered because God is man-centered, right? And uh, that book totally disabused me and my, my closest friends uh, of that notion and set a, a vision of an exalted God that um, is with me to this day. But because they stole that one, uh, I'll also recommend a book called The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, by a man named Lorraine Bettner. Uh, that is an excellent scriptural presentation of the doctrines of grace and particularly the sovereignty of God in, in salvation. Yeah, and I see the clock that we've gone past our time. You're okay. No, no, no. I, I just agree with A.W. Pink, the sovereignty of God. Just to throw out uh, two others, for me, reading a, a Body of Divinity by Thomas Watson had a huge influence on me for the doctrine of election, but more than that, the doctrine of providence, God's sovereignty over not just salvation, but over all the events and circumstances and affairs of life, uh, it, and the way it's, it, it, it's laid out as he goes through the Westminster Catechism and, and preaches through that was extraordinary. Spurgeon wrote the forward to it years later. 
Um, and then the other one is a book by James Montgomery Boyce. Josh just mentioned Boyce, but he has a book on the doctrines of grace. It's so easy to read. It's so accessible. Uh, and it was published posthumously after he died and written right before he died. So it's like his final message to the church. And it's just, uh, it's just a glorious presentation of the sovereignty of God through the five doctrines of grace. I'll start with something easy and speedy to read. Uh, Spurgeon, A Defense of Calvinism. It's more of a booklet than a book, but it's a good introduction to the subject. And then the thing that sort of shocked me out of my Arminian foolishness was John MacArthur's teaching on Ephesians 2. So I would commend his commentary on Ephesians and particularly read chapter 2 very carefully. All those are good. I, as, we, as we kind of wind things up, uh, I want to commend a book to you, uh, or rather really a, a, a psalm uh, and hymn uh, from our archive. We've got psalm, uh, Psalms and Hymns of the Living God brand new uh, from G3 Press. Uh, we're excited about this. It ex this is a book of psalms and hymns in an attempt to collect some of the best congregational songs available in the English language. Additionally, in the G3 app, we have piano accompaniments for the entire Psalter and hymnal. Uh, these are great ways for your family to worship together and other and, and in other, other settings and support. Uh, they also have needed support in, of, of, uh, of an instrument. Another helpful resource to you is your is Sing Your Part app where you can isolate or combine different voice parts to help you learn each of your parts better. That's always something I've wanted. I'm at church, I'm singing. I wanna sing the bass notes. I'm not sure exactly how those go. Uh, I, I can hear, kind of pick up a little bit. We got an organ, so I, I pick up bits and pieces of it, but having a, you know, the, the, the Saturday night before in preparation, having that help is, a, is definitely a benefit. I wanna thank each and every one of you, man. Join me in thanking these men. And Scott, I'm going to ask you to pray as we close. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your word that communicates who you are to us. And we thank you that in your word we find this wondrous truth that you are a sovereign God. We thank you that in the midst of trials and tribulation, in the midst of cultural, political situations that are oftentimes depressing, that we can affirm what your word teaches, and that is the Lord reigns. Let us rest in this truth. Let us make this truth impact every aspect of our church ministries, of our families, and our personal lives, we pray. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen.